It has stood the test of time. God's book, the Bible, still relevant in today's complex world. It is written, sharing messages of hope around the world. For ages, people have said, God is love. The Bible says, God is love. But what does that really mean? What is this love? And how is it possible that God loves? To help me take a journey in understanding that question and answering that question, I have today with me special guest, Dr. John Peckham, professor of theology and Christian philosophy at the Theological Seminary at Andrews University. Dr. Peckham has authored three books and is working on an additional three books. Dr. Peckham, want to welcome you to It Is Written Canada. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Chris. It's great to be with you. Now, John, obviously you take the understanding of who God is very seriously. Talk to me a little bit about how that happened in your life and why it's so important to you. Yeah, I grew up as a pastor's kid. So as long as I can remember, I was concerned about who God is, what God is like. And my father uh, was a youth pastor. So he did a lot of youth ministry. And that brought us into situations where we went into cities, ran soup kitchens. And I remember being struck at a very young age at the evil in the world, the suffering in the world. And yet I knew from a personal relationship with God that God was good and God was love. And how do you reconcile those two things? And it's been a long journey for me in, in wrestling with how to understand God and the God of the Bible. And so I focused my studies on God's love to try to get at that larger question of who God is and how does he relate to us. Now, I want to I wanna step back just a little bit because you and I have had uh, opportunity to talk a little bit. You had this question as a young child, really the problem of evil, the problem of the character of God. But when you began your university studies, you actually did not go in the direction of theology or pastoral ministry. What, what did you study in your undergraduate studies? That's right. My undergraduate studies, I did a, a double major in business administration and accounting. And my plan was to go on and do a JD MBA, get into high finance. Uh, it was about my, my sophomore year of undergraduate studies where I felt a strong call from God uh, that uh, whatever gifts he had given me were to be used uh, for something other than, than enriching myself. And that's not to say anything against business. It's a wonderful, noble profession. Uh, but I felt strongly that God was calling me to do something different. And that's when I uh, pursued the question of, of going into ministry, doing theological studies. Uh, I consulted uh, the seminary I was going to attend at Andrews, and they told me, uh, go ahead and finish your undergraduate degrees in business. Uh, the church can use uh, people with that background, and certainly they, they can and they do. And uh, I went ahead and finished that, and then I went straight to the seminary uh, to prepare for ministry. And you ended up going into pastoral ministry, but began your doctoral studies where you really explored this uh, this question of the character of God. In fact, you, you, your dissertation was on the concept of divine love. And, uh, and, you know, I've enjoyed so much us being able to talk, and now we're going to be sharing that with the wider audience. Now, the event that led you kind of to make that decision, mm -hmm. that kind of that career shift, that life shift for you was September 11, 2001. Yes. Where were you living at the time? How did that affect you and how did that drive you toward the direction of really wanting to understand that character of God? Yeah, I was doing my undergraduate in Massachusetts at the time and I was uh, beginning an internship. I'd just done all of the training and I was just beginning to work with a supervisor in financial planning. Uh, when that hit. And there was a number of other events that led up to that that told me that uh, maybe I should be doing something else with my life based on what God wanted for me. Uh, but when uh, the plane struck the two towers, uh, that was obviously a massive event uh, in, the, in the United States and across the world. And for me personally, I remember on that day, 
uh, my would-be supervisor was wanting me to cold call potential clients and uh, to try to get them interested in, in buying financial products like life insurance. And I was thinking, there, there, there's something wrong here. <laughs> um, and as I thought about it more, uh, the, what occurred that day was symbolic of uh, where I was, was putting my treasure, if you will. Sure. And I felt like God really wanted me to do something else. And, and I pursued that path. Well. We're thankful you pursued that path. We're thankful that God led you on that path and that you're here today to talk about it. So let's, let's talk about this, this, this character of God. Really, what's at stake when we, when we begin this exploration? Because often we take for granted, and, and I began the show by saying God is love. Mm -hmm. We take for granted that that is true. And I believe that's true, but really, what's at stake when we study this conception of God and the character of God? Yeah, really everything is at stake uh, because at the center of theology, of course, is God himself. Theology means the study of God, even yeah. though we deal with many other areas because God, if we're correct about who God is, is the creator of the world, sustainer of everything. There's nothing that doesn't relate to God. But God is at the center and how you conceive of God affects everything else that you believe and everything that you do if, you're, if what you do is actually in line with what you actually believe. So a famous theologian once said, a small mistake at the beginning is a large one at the end. And when it comes to thinking about theology and really life, if you make a mistake about understanding God, uh, that's going to affect everything else that you think theologically. And as a Christian, it's going to affect your life, the way you relate to other people. So I can't think of anything else that's more important. In fact, uh, I want to take you to John 17, verse 3. Okay. John 17, verse 3 on this. And I share this with my students all the time as I'm introducing them uh, to uh, one of my introductory uh, Christian theology courses. Uh, John 17, 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Now those words were spoken by Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. And he's talking about knowing God as central to eternal life. Now I don't think he means in that text merely theological beliefs, but in order to know someone, you have to know some things about them. I mean, it would be really strange if I would say to my wife, or before she was my wife, you know, as we were dating, if I said, you know, I'd really like to have a relationship with you, but can we just never talk? I mean, right. don't, please don't ever tell me anything about you because, you know, that part's not important to me. I just want to have a relationship with you. That doesn't make sense. No. So to know God includes much more than knowing theology and theological beliefs, but not less than that. And so this, this uh, what is really at stake here is we talk about having a relationship with Jesus. Christianity is about a relationship with Jesus, a relationship right. with God. Yet maybe the fundamental problem that we're facing is sometimes who we think God is yes. is not really who he is. And so what's really at stake here is the very core of everything that this book teaches about who God is. Any other text that can help us in kind of beginning this journey of understanding who God is? Yeah, I want to take you to 1 John 4, 8. Uh, and, and as we're going there, um, you, you're so right about people's conception of God and having a misconception of God affecting their relationship with Him. A lot of people don't have a relationship with God because the God they have in mind isn't the true and living God, right? So uh, some people have had negative experiences with their own parents. The Bible uses a lot of imagery of God as a father and God as a parent. And they project onto God maybe the kind of experiences they've had with humans, not realizing that God is is perfect. <laughs> He's much better than anything we've experienced here. Or they have heard of theological conceptions of God uh, that make God culpable for evil or other kinds of things. And they are not interested in having a relationship with that God. Yes. But the God of the Bible is, is quite different. 1 John 4, 8 tells us that God is love. And it says actually more than that. The entire verse says, he who does not love does not know God. That goes back to what we were just talking about, yes, right? Yes. That if you claim to, to know God and, and you don't love and don't love other people, elsewhere in 1 John, 
he says, you're a liar, right? Because if you know God, you will love others because God is love. The question is, as you mentioned earlier, what does that mean? Because if I asked, if I surveyed even 10 people and asked them, what is love? I would probably get 10 different answers, right? <laughs> yes, well, and, 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 and this might take our conversation a little bit different direction, but you know, it's an interesting thing. I've talked about this, I've used this illustration before. In the English language, it, it, there's a weakness in that we have this word love Yes. that is used in a variety of contexts. I love my wife, I love my mom, I love my dog, Right. I love this food. Right. And the question becomes is what yeah. is love? Now there are other languages that use a variety of words to describe what love is. Mm -hmm. uh, Spanish, French, other of these languages. So maybe let's just dwell a little bit here sure. on this, what is love? And the biblical concept of love. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but how many different words, or relatively speaking, how many words are used in the Bible to describe love? Yeah, it depends on how you would go about answering that question. Okay. Because just like English, uh, uh, the words that are used for love have that broad variety of meanings. So the love for a parent, the love for a spouse, the love for a friend, those can all be signified by the same word in Greek, for instance, the, the language the New Testament was written in. Mm. On the other hand, the Bible does have a, a lot more words. And so the range of the meaning of the words is, is quite broad, but then there's a lot of words that add nuances and shades of meaning. So the main words for love in the Old Testament and the New Testament are, are a handful of terms. In the New Testament, the most famous terminology is agape. Uh, then you have uh, the philos, uh, which is the noun form of that word, or phileo is the verb form sure. of that in the New Testament. Those are the two main words that are translated love, but it would be a mistake for us to think that those are the only two words that are dealing with love, because love is such a broad and central concept. That language in both the New Testament and the Old Testament that's dealing with God's delight, with God's pleasure, even in some cases that's very closely related to God's choice. Uh, that terminology is all very closely related to love and sometimes actually referring to love itself. In the Old Testament, we have a similar thing going on. We have words like ahav, a word chesed, which one, uh, one commentator said that you need at least a paragraph to describe what the word chesed means. <laughs> it's usually translated loving kindness sure. uh, in the King James and New King James Version. Other, other versions translate it loyal love or steadfast love. And those are all good words to describe it, but it's that and more. Mercy, compassion, it's even related to justice. And it, there's this beautiful, fully orbed concept of God's love that the view that I had of God's love when I started studying it is extremely impoverished in comparison to what I found. And no doubt there's much more than what I found of God's love. Uh, but even what I've been able to, to see from scripture, it's much more than I, than I ever imagined. Well, it's it, just that few moments of talking about gives us opportunity to pause when we say God is love. Yes. And in our mind say, oh, I know what that means just the variety of, of, of words and concepts that you were just delving into. You know, I, one of my favorite Christian authors talks about that, that throughout eternity we will be studying the science of salvation, and I That's think right. a part of that science is God's love toward us. That's right. So it's probably important right at the outset in understanding that love that um, when we talk about love, in order for love to truly be love, it gives us the ability to say yes or to say no. Mm. It's a response, a, a, a give and take situation. I think we're gonna expand on that. Yes. But you know, there are a number of people who are watching, Christian or not, who have had this conception of God as one who predestines or predetermines yes. everything. Let's talk about that a little bit because that is a little difficult for me as you talk about the grace and the mercy and the yes. delight and the pleasure and the compassion to package up with a God who simply predestines everything. Let's talk about that debate a little bit that goes on mm -hmm. and probably talk about that because there are probably man, many viewers who have heard this yes. and actually have been turned off to a relationship with God on what they might consider to be an arbitrary predestination. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah, there's a... a 
very close relationship between that issue of God predestining or determining everything and the concept of divine love. In fact, one of the most traditional views of God's love is based on the view that God doesn't really have a reciprocal relationship with humans, but only a one-way or unilateral relationship with humans, which means uh, that if God is acting on the world at all, it's in this predestinarian or deterministic way. And so they take the concept of, of love and they say that love is, uh, from God's perspective, is a choice. It's entirely volitional. And he chooses to love some unto salvation and others not unto salvation. He gives grace to everyone on that particular theological strain, uh, but he only loves some in a way that they actually will be saved. And if God loves you that way, uh, it's, it's technically called in some theologies unconditional election, but they mean by that the same thing as uh, unconditional love. They could substitute the word love for election. Now they don't mean by that what you and I would mean if we said unconditional love, but for them, Love, from God's perspective, just is his choice. So unconditional election is God's unconditional choice of someone to be saved. And love is the same thing. In fact, if you read some commentators that say, for God to love is to choose, to choose is to love, you could put an equal sign between them. That view has a long history in Christian theology, not just on love, but on the way God could relate to the world, because there were particular conceptions of God uh, based primarily on some... Uh, very famous Greek philosophies about what it takes to be a perfect kind of being that said that a perfect kind of being couldn't really love in any sense of the term that humans are accustomed to because that wouldn't be perfect. At least they thought that was the case. Sure. And therefore, they had this view of God as very transcendent, very removed from the world, uh, very much not able to be affected by anything that occurs in the world, and therefore, God's love must be this unilateral relationship. Now, let's hit a pause button there uh, because I, I want you to unpack that a little bit. So yes. what you're saying is, is that there are some teachers who have taught, some people who have believed that God has had this attitude toward humanity that he's close enough to choose to love some, mm -hmm. that they will sense that love and choose salvation. And he will love others, but that love will be distant enough that they won't choose salvation and, and effectively be lost. And so it's almost kind of this arm's length relationship uh, of, a, of a God who almost comes across as arbitrary, loving some, not loving others, and it leaves us really entrenched in this question, okay, if the Bible says God is love, that doesn't sound very loving. That sounds like God has a, uh, a bit of favoritism uh, that is favoritism that comes across as quite arbitrary. Am I summarizing what you just said there in a fair, uh, in a fair way? It, let's talk about that. Let's probe that a little deeper yeah. there. Yeah, even, even, even stronger than, than that. It's not just that they won't choose, they can't choose to accept God's wow. grace on that model. Now, to be fair to those who, who believe in that view, uh, it does sound a bit arbitrary. On their view, it's not arbitrary. They would say because God is sovereign, uh, no one deserves salvation, so we should just be happy that he chooses to save some and, and, not, and not worry about the ones that he chooses not to save. Uh, but it's very troubling from my perspective because uh, I believe that the Bible teaches, and we may have some opportunity to get into this a little bit later, uh, that God does want to save everyone, and he does everything he can to save everyone. But there's a long trajectory of this in Christian theology, and every trajectory of Christian theology is heavily debated, even the way things originated. Uh, but the typical understanding, which I think is correct, is that this view was introduced into Christian theology by a theologian by the name of Augustine. Augustine uh, was a late 4th century, early 5th century uh, church father, yes. the most influential theologian outside of the Bible in the history of Christianity. Uh, many uh, scholars of Christian history make the claim that before Augustine, the majority of, of Christian theologians, early fathers, believed in the kind of free will where you could choose to accept 
God's love. You could choose to accept his grace and be saved, or you could reject it. And not in a way that you could earn it. It's always unmeritorious. It's always a gift of grace. Yes. But you have the choice to accept that and be saved or not. Augustine, uh, again here, there's some dispute because there's many people who follow Augustine in many different trajectories. Sure. And as is usually the case, people who claim someone as their forebear often interpret that person in a way that lines up maybe with their view. Sure. Uh, but I think it's safe to say that uh, the majority, or at least a great many of scholars, uh, believe that Augustine's view himself changed. One of the first books that he wrote was on free choice of the will. And in that book, he at least appears to be saying something very similar to the kind of free will I just described. Yes. But then he had a, an encounter with some Christians who were saying basically that you have the kind of will that you could basically save yourself. You can pull yourself out by your bootstraps, right? This is a theology called Pelagianism, okay. uh, technically by, by the a name of a Christian by Pelagius. Sure. They got into a controversy and uh, out of that controversy, as the story is usually told, Augustine, uh, to cut off Pelagianism, moved towards determinism or predestinarian theology. Some people say he didn't move at all. He always believed that it just wasn't as clear. Uh, but the way I read him, it looks like he moved. Sure. And then after Augustine, uh, the, the vast majority of, of theologians had something of that strain in their theology all the way through the Reformation and beyond. Well, and this is very helpful. It, you know, as you know, the title of our program is It Is Written. And our commitment is not a commitment to a creed or a statement of faith, mm -hmm. but our commitment is to the Word of God. Yes. So what I'm hearing you say is that originally out of the Word, and, and maybe you could pull, uh, I'm going to ask you to read a text in just a moment that talks about how God loves everyone and doing all he can to save everyone. Yes. The biblical view is this is what God's love looks like, but at some point in the distant past, around the 4th and 5th century, around 300, 400 AD, introduced into the Christian church is a bias placed upon the Bible that now makes God's love not a equally loving everyone and trying to save everyone, but now... God loves some more than others, determining in advance who will and who will not be saved. So let's, let's uh, we have just a few minutes left here. So let's go to a text that yes. talks about God's love of everyone. So what's a text that you'd like to go to in talking about? There are many texts. The first one that we should go to, and you'll tell me how many we can go to, John 3.16. Okay. This is the most famous text in the Bible. Uh, John 3.16. We know it by heart. Probably many, many who are watching yes. today know this text by heart. John 3, 16. Uh, often we, 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 we know it so well, and this happens with a lot of texts in the Bible. We know it so well, we just read over it and don't realize the, the full significance of what is being said there. But John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever... What was that word? <laughs> whoever, that's, that's everybody. Whoever, yes. whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So he loves the world. That is a statement of totality. And whoever believes in him will be saved. And if we were to keep reading in John 3, you would see that the reason in the text that anyone's lost is because they have not accepted salvation through Christ, not because of the decision of God. And there are many other texts that teach this view that God wants to save everyone. Well, and it's interesting because verse 17, which it's, it's you know, I often say everyone quotes John 3, 16. That's right. But verse 17 That's follows, right. for God did not send his son into the world yes. to condemn the world. That's right. But that the world through him might be saved. And that word saved, there is real interesting Greek word, sozo, that talks about healing both, yes. uh, not spiritually, just spiritually, but physically, mentally, emotionally. And so this is a powerful way in which we can end this program here that we talk about God sent his son because he loved everyone, whosoever, not to condemn, but to save, to bring healing. So in this last minute that we have left, mm -hmm. Dr. Peckham, share with us one thought that we can leave our audience with today. 
Yeah, it is this thought that God really wants to save us. He wants to have a love relationship with us. Uh, 2 Peter 3, 9 says he's not willing that anyone would perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. And God is doing everything he can to save everyone he can because he loves you, he loves me, he loves everyone watching today. And so if, if, if one even has uh, the smallest inkling that they want a relationship with this God, he is reaching out to you, he's calling to you to have a relationship of love with him. Dr. Peckham, thank you so much for sharing. We are all out of time, and so we're gonna leave folks with a little bit of a cliffhanger, but next week we're going to continue this discussion and probe who this God of love really is. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you are love. Even in saying that, we don't even understand really the minutest bit of what or how far that love really goes. But Lord, as we study your word, we see that this love is overflowing toward each of us. Mm -hmm. Today, we want to respond to that love reach out our hand of faith and say, we want a relationship with you. Please guide us in this journey. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Dear friend, I hope that you have been blessed by today's program. Dr. John Peckham, thank you so much for being a part and giving us insight into this love of God. Thank you, Chris. Friend, I want to encourage you to go to our website, itiswrittencanada.ca. There you will be able to find more resources to help you in this journey of understanding who this God of love is and how much he desires to have a relationship with you. I also want to encourage you to like our Facebook page. There you can keep up with what's happening in the ministry and receive inspirational quotes to help you to love God. Thank you so much for watching. I encourage you to watch again next week. Until then, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.